Merry Christmas, and welcome to Classic Comedy of Old Time Radio. I'm your host, Ron Ecklebarger. In celebration of the upcoming Christmas holiday, I presented a special Christmas episode on Tuesday. And now here is another one, today, Thursday, of this week leading up to Christmas, which happens to be on Saturday this year, 2021. These episodes will not be strictly comedy episodes, but will be representative of what was often heard at Christmas time on the radio during its golden age. Today, we listen to a truly historic episode. This episode is a Christmas special aired by the BBC on Christmas Day, 1940. Just in case some of you need a history refresher, here it is. King George VI became king when his older brother, Edward VIII, abdicated the throne so he could marry Wallace Simpson, an American who had been divorced. At that time, for a king to marry a divorced woman, especially a divorced American, was very much frowned upon, so he had to abdicate. King George, known as Bertie in the royal family, had stuttered since he was eight years old. His condition worsened after he was created Duke of York in 1920 and had to take on official engagements, like speaking in public. So, in 1926, after seeing multiple speech therapists, Bertie went to see Lionel Logue for one final try to fix his condition. This encounter was immortalized in the 2010 film The King's Speech, which I highly recommend. Also, this was the second Christmas in the United Kingdom after the beginning of World War II, which began on September 1st, 1939. London was in the middle of the Blitz. On September 7th, 1940, Hitler began a bombing campaign of London and other English cities. During eight months of bombardment, over 40,000 British civilians were killed. This BBC Christmas special begins with some morale-boosting Christmas greetings from real people living through the bombings, and it finishes with the King's Christmas speech. You'll notice his measured tones and occasional stammers. Let's now go to London. Christmas Day, 1940. a Welsh hymn, a hymn of joy and sacrifice. In that spirit we carry on, ere is or no, and for long as this war lasts, these furnaces shall never go cold. We'll keep them as warm as the voices of those boys singing, and as warm as the greeting from Wales I now send to you. To our boys in the air, on sea, and on land, to the people in battered cities and towns throughout Britain, to our fellow workers in the mines, in the factories and the fields, aye, and to the women, God bless them, whose courage is our pride. To you all, a Welsh greeting. Nadoli Cowen, a bended you. A happy Christmas, and God be with you. We've seen the empire and the country in action this Christmas day. Underneath it all, we've felt that spirit of companionship and neighborliness, which must be the foundation of the world of peace. And now, when we return to London, it isn't because other cities aren't in the front line as well as London. We turn to London because here we have the largest collection of human beings who stood up to the greatest aerial bombardment the world's ever known. Let's look at London on the alert. The firefighters of London. Men who in the last three months 
have gone out night after night to the fires in the Blitz, and by their courage and daring have saved thousands of lives. We salute them this Christmas Day, and through them, all the workers in our civil defence services all over Britain. So over to London's East End to see what sort of a Christmas men of the fire services are having. First of all, we would like to wish you all a happy Christmas, especially to all other fire brigades. To this, I would like to add my personal greetings to my family who are evacuated. We are down in the basement here, as it is a bit drafty upstairs due to the loss of windows. We have had quite a packet since the blitz started. We started off with a bang when we got one the first night. That night left some empty places, and we are thinking of those fellows today. But most of all, but most of us are still here ready for anything. You see, this is just another day for us, and we are all ready for whatever turns up. Here are some of the men and the girls who are on, on duty today. Come on, Tuffy, you start. Well, this year, it's Christmas under fire with a vengeance. It's not the best way to spend Christmas, but a bit back, some of us didn't expect to see another Christmas at all. Things were a bit hot in more ways than one. What do you say, Tom? Well, they were hot, all right. A bit too hot. And I'll tell you one thing about fires, too. I'd rather sight be sitting around my own fire now instead of waiting to put other people's fires out. I'll say we've got that man to thank for that. There's one place I'd like to start a fire, and that's not far from him. I've got something to say to him, too. Look at me sitting at the telephone. I can't even call out my boyfriend. <laughs> ah. ah, but the food's pretty good. The wallop as well, I'll say. <laughs> it's the first time my wife and I have been apart at Christmas. She's down in the country living with a kitty. So here's wishing Peg, Ma and Dad a happy Christmas. We're, uh, we're not so bad here. So don't start worrying. You're next, sir. I've had plenty of Christmases at work before because I was a merchant seaman before I joined the fire business. So here's good luck to all the chaps in the merchant navy and to Ada and Mum. Keep at it. Hello, Elsie. Hello, Mum. Dad, a Merry Christmas. Come, Miss Julius. What about you? Well, I come from South Africa. So hello, everybody out there, and a happy Christmas to you all. I suppose you are enjoying your Christmas in the sunshine. I am enjoying mine in a fire station. We are thrilled to hear how you are holding the line down there. Well, and now it's time to go over the road. Merry Christmas, Maisie. Hello, everybody. We're not having a bad time here. There's dispatch riders and drivers, and we've got a few friends along, too. We've covered all the walls with streamers, and they'll come in handy soon for the victory parade. In the meantime, we've got a bit of work to do, and if anybody wants a rider, well, it's just bad luck on that chap. Good old shorty. Come on, your turn next. All right, all right. Anybody would think I never did any work. I don't know. Well, do you? Yes. Quiet your beast. Come on, Brownie. What about saying about that brother of yours in Palestine? Sure, it's not a bad idea. If Driver Brown's listening, he's wishing him good luck and all the rest of the chaps there also. Now, quiet a moment, lad. The dispatch right is wanted over 28 immediately. Not an MP. Come on, Shorty. Come on, Shorty. Come on. Oh, well, I mean, what about someone else? They've always got me on it. Like the citizens of many of our towns this Christmas, Londoners have been forced to adapt their lives to war conditions. Many of them have lost their homes, although they go on with their work uninterrupted. But the vast majority, nearly 90% of them, go on living and sleeping in their own houses. But a great many Londoners do have to spend their nights in shelters. And it's no joke, this shelter life at any time, with its hardship and strain, the lack of privacy, not having your own things around you. But it's... Grimness seems to strike us even more at Christmas. Christmas in the shelter, driven underground. What a paradox it seems. Of course, the people who shelter are making the best of it. They make the best of everything at Christmas. And you can't kill the spirit of Christmas, even in these gloomy modern catacombs. Even there, it shines like a star. Well, let's go over to one of London's communal shelters... To see how the shelter marshal and his people are preparing for Christmas night below ground. We have had weeks of preparation for this celebration underground, and now we are just putting the final touches to everything. Of course, the bulk of our people aren't down yet, except a few of the very early ones. 
but all the same, it's an animated scene. Can I have some sort of coat from the wardrobe, Mr. Sankster? Oh, later, please, Mr. Dally. He's broadcasting. Well, me own's been bombed out. In between the sandbagged partitions, the wooden bunks, one above the other, are decorated with flags and streamers. And across the arched roof, our guests have hung great festoons of coloured paper. Who won the prize, Mr. Sankster? There's time enough for that, Mrs. Hill. That's a competition in decorations we've had between the sections. I'm announcing that at the concert tonight. We left the decoration of the place to them, and a very good job they've made of it. They have had enough of our, on our own hands, getting in a Christmas tree, and the food for the banquet, and a present for every child. Oh, Mr. Sankster? Yes, Doris? Is that right? Father Christmas is coming? Well, I wouldn't be at all surprised if he does, dear. I think this must be the strangest home that Santa Claus will ever have visited. For home it is for most of these guests of ours. The only home they've got. Our motto is, our aim is to give you security, cheerfulness and sleep. So sleep if you can. We get our courage in our sleep. Mr. Sankster? Not now, Doris. May I have that doll up there? Afterwards, my dear, not now. And now I'm going to turn you over to the sister who will be able to tell you some of the details of the banquet. Now, sister, it's your turn. Well, there's really not very much to say. Except that we're doing our best, and we think we're going to be able to give everybody a very good time. It's taken quite a while to lay in food for all these people. About 500 of us are going to sit down. Lummy, are we sitting down to it? Yes, a regular sit-down feed. Lovely, lovely. Lovely. Yes, sit down. We have cleared a whole section to sit down at big tables. Just like a family Christmas dinner in the old days. Ah. Most of them have paid a little towards the celebration. Not much, but it gives everyone a sense of responsibility. But even if they haven't been able to pay well, it's just the same. The very best food we can get. And a bit extra in the way of bonbons. Ain't it fine? And afterwards, crackers for everyone. When can I have that doll, Mr. Sankster? Oh, Doris, are you back again? <coughs> Not now, dear. We're broadcasting. We have been able to hire all the plates we need, but everybody is supposed to bring their own forks and spoons and so on. It's wonderful where the money and the help comes from, with so many people bombed out of their homes. Still, we are going to have a Merry Christmas in spite of Hitler. I, Mr. Costin, you didn't fold your blankets this morning. Sorry, sir, it was a hurry. Well, if you want to leave them here during the day, you'll have to fold them up before you go. In this cramped shelter life, everything counts. Every inch of space, every act of kindness and thoughtfulness. We get used to it after a time and come to accept it as normal. But we must never forget that it is not normal. It is the direct opposite of the home life that the war has taken away from so many of us. There may be more elaborate parties going on elsewhere today, I quite think there are. But there's certainly none with more of the true spirit of Christmas. More cheerfulness, more friendliness, more neighborliness and determination to make the best of things. And so, from this underground shelter, we Londoners send our greetings to you who are listening all over the world. To our friends, to our empire and to our king. Well, that's Christmas in one of London's underground shelters. We're all hoping it'll be the last. And now, for our final picture, we go to one of London's homes. Just an ordinary home, this. It's one of a row in a suburban street with both a number and a name. Today, it's not quite as ordinary as it was a few months ago. Some of the neighboring houses in the row aren't there anymore. Some of its windows are broken and patched with brown paper. But behind the patched up windows, everything's warm and bright. It's the home of one of London's mothers. She'll tell you what it's like to spend Christmas under fire. This Christmas will be very quiet for a lot of middle-aged mothers. Take me, for instance. My children are away. 
My son is in the Air Force. My daughter is living on a farm. And my two grandchildren are evacuated to the country. We always used to spend Christmas together, but we are parted this year for the first time. And it's bound to be a bit lonely, you know. Most people of our age are staying behind, and it's the little ones we miss. We've had 22 window panes out here, and a bomb behind us in the next street. That whole French window has got to come out one of these days. Oh, well, we've been through some bad times. We have. But sitting here on Christmas Day, I've been thinking of the last war and its food problems, and how we used to have to stand in queues hoping to get a few potatoes. I went through all that with three little children. I lost one of them. It's a horrible thing is war, but you know in a way it has its compensations. It's made us realise how good and kind most people are, and that's a great comfort in the middle of all this anxiety. We've all got our ration books. There are no favours asked or given. There's a feeling of fairness and goodwill which keeps people cheerful. An invitation to share that tea ration over a friendly chat is such a good way of helping the lonely ones round about us. One morning, after a heavy air raid, I saw a woman standing at her gate looking at the destruction all around her. I stopped and made a remark about it and the terrible experience she must have had. Then she said, I've seen you in this room for years. Yes, I said, and it's taken a bomb to make us speak. I went onto the stationer who said, don't say you've come to tell me you're going away. That's all I've heard this morning from my customers. Well, I'm not going away. And in spite of all we've been through, I'm thankful for a great deal. When peace comes along at last, we've all got to see that this spirit of neighbourliness and sympathy is carried on and not forgotten. And now, on behalf of all the men and women of the Empire, and all who are listening on this Christmas Day, it is my great privilege to offer our greetings to their majesties, our King and Queen. From the bottom of our hearts, God bless them both. That heartfelt greeting to our King and the Royal Family from one of the bombed homes of London is echoed throughout the world in the hearts and homes of our friends and kinsmen. They are waiting as we are in their homes, to listen to the voice of His Majesty the King. Feast of Christmas is a time when we all are gathered together in our homes, the young and old, to enjoy the happy festivity and goodwill for which the Christmas message brings. It is, above all, Children's Day. And I am sure that we shall all do our best to make it a happy one for them, wherever they may be. Wool brings, among other sorrows, the sadness of separation. There are many in the forces away from their homes today. 
And because they must stand ready and alert to resist the invader, should he dare to come, or because they are guarding the dark seas, or pursuing the beaten foe in the Libyan, a desert. Many family circles are broken. Children from English homes are today in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa. For not only has the manhood of the whole British Commonwealth rallied once more to the aid of the mother country in her hour of need, but the peoples of the empire have eagerly thrown open the doors of their homes to our children so that they may be spared from the strain and danger of modern war. And in the United States also, where we find so many generous, loyal friends and organizations to give us unstinted help, warm-hearted people are keeping and caring for many of our children until the war is over. But how many more children are there here who have been moved from their homes to safer quarters? To all of them, at home and abroad, who are separated from their fathers and mothers, to their kind friends and hosts, and to all who love them, and to parents who will be lonely without them. From all in our dear island, I wish every happiness that Christmas can bring. May the new year carry us towards victory and to happier Christmas days when everyone will be at home together in the years to come. To the older people here and throughout the world, I would say, in the last great war, the flower of our youth was destroyed and the rest of the people saw but little of the battle. This time we are all in the front line and the danger together and I know that the older among us are proud that it should be so. Remember this. If war brings its separation, it brings a new unity also. A unity which comes from common perils and common sufferings are willingly shared. To be good comrades and good neighbors in trouble is one of the finest opportunities of the civilian population. And by facing hardship and discomfort, cheerfully and resolutely, not only do they do their own duty, 
but they play their part in helping the fighting services to win the war. Time and again, during these last few months, I have seen for myself battered towns and cities of England, and I have seen the British people facing their ordeal. I can say to them all, that they may be justly proud of their race and nation. On every side I have seen a new and splendid spirit of good fellowship springing up in adversity, a will, a desire to share the burdens and resources alike. Out of all this suffering, there is growing a harmony which we must carry forward into the days to come. When we have endured to the end, and ours is the victory, then when Christmas days are happy again and goodwill has come back to the world. We must hold fast to the spirit which binds us all together now. We shall need the spirit in each of our own lives as men and women, and shall need it even more among the nations of the world. We must go on thinking less about ourselves and more for one another. For so, and so only, can we hope to make the world a better place and life a worthier thing. And now I wish you all a happy Christmas and a happier New Year. We may look forward to it with sober confidence. We have surmounted a grave a crisis. We do not underrate the dangers and difficulties which confront us still. But we take the courage and comfort from the successes which our fighting men and the allies have won at heavy odds by land and air and sea. The future will be hard, but our feet are planted on the path of victory. And with the help of God, we shall make our way to justice and to peace.
I can't imagine what it must have been like to live through the Blitz. This episode is a great piece of history, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Please send your questions and comments to host at ClassicComedyOTR.com. Come back tomorrow for a Christmas episode of The Life of Riley. Until then, in the words of Charles Dickens, Happy, happy Christmas that can win us back to the delusions of our childhood days. Recall to the old man the pleasures of his youth and transport the traveler back to his own fireside and quiet home.